Hello everyone, welcome back to <clears throat> yet another webinar on the MI2 series. This time I'm pretty excited to bring you Linkerd, a very uh, popular emerging service mesh technology that you can use with your microservices. So if you're attending the MI2 webinar for the first time, let me set the context. So MI2 stands for Machine Intelligence and Modern Infrastructure. These are two emerging technologies that are very, very interesting and they're also going to redefine the future. Machine intelligence is all about IoT and AI, while modern infrastructure is all about containers, microservices, and related technologies like observability and service mesh. So every alternate week, I bring you a webinar covering one of these two technologies. What's unique about MI2 is that every session is accompanied by, of course, a video, the presentation, a tutorial, and the complete code, uh, along with all the resources that you need to get started. This is a completely independent and neutral platform to explore emerging technologies. I cover a broad, broad range of technologies, <clears throat> ranging from Intel's accelerators to NVIDIA GPUs to um, serverless technologies from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and IBM. So this is very broad, very neutral, and a platform to explore emerging technologies. So before we go any further, let me bring up a poll to make sure that you're able to listen to the audio and see my screen. So is the audio and video quality good? Okay, uh, most of you are telling me that this is good. So I assume you're able to see the screen and hear the audio. That's excellent. All right, so, <clears throat> What I'm going to cover today is a very quick overview of service mesh. If you have attended my previous webinars on Istio and AWS App Mesh, then you already know what is service mesh, but in case you're joining for the first time, I'm going to set this stage by introducing service mesh, and then we'll take a look at Linkerd, the emerging service mesh technology, followed by a closer look at Linkerd architecture, and then I have a very detailed demo that's going to help us understand how to install Istio, how to configure it, I'm sorry, is <laughs> install Linkerd, uh, configure it and use it to mesh your microservices. <clears throat> so before I go any further, I want to bring up a poll, which is what was in my mind when I said Istio, because I know a lot of people are already familiar with Istio. So let me bring up the poll and find out how many of you use a service mesh today. And if you use, what is your most preferred service mesh? Oh, wow, okay. <clears throat> so it's interesting that most of you use Istio, but at the same time, there are users for Linkerd. I, I hope it is 2.0, which is one of the uh, 2.3, the most recent version of Linkerd, which comes with many interesting features. <clears throat> uh, before, I really get into the details. I also want to find out your experience in dealing with service mesh. So how do you rate yourself? A novice, an intermediate user, or an expert? All right, so most of you are novices when it comes to service mesh, that's not a problem. This session is all about appreciating and <clears throat> understanding the use of service mesh. So let's get started. Microservices are becoming extremely popular, <clears throat> but with all the benefits it brings, there are also a lot of challenges with microservices. Some of the attributes of microservices is that they are based on uh, polyglot development, which means developers use best of the breed languages, tools, and frameworks to create each of the services. Microservices are highly distributed when you are running it in a fleet of uh, uh, servers or hosts running as a cluster. You, you never know how they are going to be distributed and how they are going to be scheduled. So they are running across the cluster, across multiple hosts at the given moment. So it's very hard to debug uh, and also to implement logging and tracing. It is not just one component that is emitting a lot of logs um, and, and tracing information, but this is coming from <clears throat> multiple instances of microservices running across the cluster. They also dynamically scale in and scale out, which means 
uh, if you are implementing an auto scale policy, for example, in Kubernetes, there is something called horizontal pod auto scale feature. If you're implementing that, there is no guarantee on the number of microservices that may run at any given point. They may run <clears throat> depending on the load, the traffic, and how um, the, the current uh, traffic condition is, is uh, uh, configured. So it's extremely dynamic. And of course, microservices use disparate protocols. You may use REST, uh, RabbitMQ, Kafka, gRPC, NATS, and a variety of other protocols, which makes it really difficult to uh, <clears throat> get into observability and understand how the traffic flows uh, and, and, and implementing some of the policies to optimize the uh, performance. Microservices implement internal and external load balancers. Uh, all the <clears throat> external facing services typically have an ingress or a load balancer front ending them. But at the same time, there are a lot of internal load balancers to route the traffic to one of the instances of the microservices. So it's, it's a pretty complicated, uh, very complex topology that we deal with uh, when, when we are using microservices in production. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you actually look at how we can solve some of these challenges, it comes to a point where you need to write an agent that sits next to your service. And this agent is responsible for implementing a lot of best practices and policies to make sure that your overall mesh of services, the topology of services uh, is, is healthy and is doing the right thing. So this might sound very simple, writing an SDK or an agent that is specific to a service, but in reality, Remember that your microservices are written in a variety of languages and you want to write these agents or SDKs that stick themselves to every service in the same language, which means you have to maintain multiple versions of these agents written in different languages. And why do you need such agent? Well, the agent has to um, make sure that the outbound call is going to the right service and the right version. And it, it also needs to figure out that the uh, service that it is calling is healthy and it is able to respond in time. So you don't waste the uh, resources by, by, by trying to call a service that is either um, erroneous or it is timing out. So the agent is responsible for making sure that uh, your traffic is optimized and because it is uh, acting as a, as a kind of pass through proxy, it has visibility into the inbound and outbound calls. So the agent can get a lot of insights uh, from the way the traffic is flowing back and forth and also can implement a variety of <clears throat> best practices of distributed computing like retries and circuit breaking um, and, and uh, implementing timeouts and so on. But, but remember, you got to write each of those agents in the language of your choice and maintaining them, versioning them and uh, running it as a platform is going to be extremely expensive. Now these agents, need to report into a centralized monitoring service. And this service is going to be the control plane or the command and control center for all the agents. And again, it's your responsibility to write that central monitoring service and also ensure that it is highly available because if the central monitoring service is down, then the agents cannot really send the telemetry or the insights data and that actually defies the purpose. So maintaining the uh, software for the central monitoring service as well as all the agents is going to be very challenging. At the same time, this agent should understand a variety of protocols including HTTP, gRPC, um, GraphQL, NATS, Kafka, and so on. And, and uh, for load balancing, they need to have an L7 load balancer for HTTP and for TCP and outbound, they may implement an L4 uh, load balancer. So this is going to be very challenging if you are doing it all by yourself. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so what exactly is the service mesh? Well, the service mesh plugs itself into the intra-service communication topology. What it really means is instead of you writing the agents and the control plane, the service mesh comes with all the components that you need to, to actually run uh, the best practice based microservices or distributed computing. 
This service mesh intercepts east and west and sometimes even north and south traffic to make sure that it is capturing all the data related to network traffic, both inbound and outbound, and use that for a variety of uh, statistics and analytics. It adds an implicit security layer, even if you are not securing your microservices, the service mesh brings in implicit mutual TLS, making sure that the traffic flowing between one service and the other is always secured. It also enables service discovery, which is a big challenge when implementing microservices. Service one should be able to easily discover service two. And when you have multiple versions of the same service and you want to route traffic selectively, you can actually manipulate the service discovery to make sure that the calling component or the calling microservice all, always sees uh, a different version of the uh, microservice rather than what it is intending to talk. So this will enable you to implement interesting routing and traffic, uh, traffic policies. Um, for example, you can implement blue-green deployments by selectively <clears throat> routing the traffic to different versions. You can also do canary releases and closely monitor the performance and uh, move your uh, versions of microservices into production. And uh, most of the implementations of service mesh interface very well with legacy and modern infrastructure, which means they can work with virtual machines as well as uh, modern infrastructure based on microservices and containers. So that's a quick overview of service mesh. Now mapping what we saw earlier to a typical service mesh, it would actually look like this. So <clears throat> instead of you writing a language service specific agent, the service mesh would give you a proxy that is very generic. It is language uh, framework and tool agnostic proxy that sits next to your service. And then uh, the service mesh also comes with a control plane to which all the proxy is reporting to, they call home with, with all the data that needs to be sent, which is called telemetry. And the proxy can understand a variety of protocols so that it can intercept the outbound and inbound traffic effectively. So <clears throat> the advantage of using a service mesh is you're not going to write the proxy, you're not going to write the control plane, you're not going to maintain any of that. And uh, the best thing is your code need not be manipulated or modified to integrate with a, with a service mesh topology. Most of the service mesh technologies and the projects that we have in the open source community are applicable, which means you can take an existing service and immediately integrate that with a service mesh deployment. So that makes it um, very uh, easy to integrate and there is no friction at all uh, when it comes to integrating your existing services with the service mesh. And they are loosely coupled, which means you can selectively upgrade the, the service mesh proxy while uh, your uh, microservice continues to run the same version. Uh, similarly, you can maintain the proxy as the same, but upgrade your um, microservice seamlessly without ever modifying or manipulating your proxy layer. So this is a plug and play uh, concept where you bring in the proxy and the control plane and start implementing everything that you need to do with uh, microservices running in a distributed computing environment. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, bear with me because I have sore throat. Uh, the weather is really bad. It, all the heat and all the cold water, it is, it is not easy. <clears throat> so I might clear my throat multiple times because of the um, sore throat that I have. Bear with me. So what exactly is Linkerd? Well, uh, we have just seen the service mesh, which is a combination of a control plane and the data plane. And if you have attended my previous sessions on App Mesh and uh, Istio, you would actually find this pretty familiar. Now, coming to Linkerd, it is also an open source service mesh project. And the unique thing about Linkerd is it's a CMC of member project, which means the custodian of Linkerd is uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. The company that actually contributes, and which is almost like the founding member of Linkerd community, is BioEnt. So they actually created Linkerd and eventually uh, evolved that into uh, two point text that we are currently dealing with. So it's been in production for about two years. <clears throat> uh, it has a very active community, 10,000 plus GitHub stars, 100 plus contributors used by a lot of enterprises like Expedia, Comcast, eBay, and so on. Uh, enjoys a lot of fanfare um, among open source community as well as 
uh, web scale companies. <clears throat> so uh, why should you use Linkerd? Now coming to Linkerd's architecture, I'm going to touch upon that a little later, but Linkerd, first of all, gives you tremendous visibility into your microservice deployment. It automatically captures the golden metrics, which are absolutely critical to monitor for the success of your deployment. And that includes the success rate, the latency and throughput. <clears throat> so you can pretty much visualize the live traffic just staring at the dashboard or by using the CLI. It's a pretty powerful mechanism to gain insights into um, a deployment that is already live. And you can implement uh, retries, timeout, circuit breaking, deadlines, request balancing, which are some of the best practices of doing distributed computing. So uh, if, if, if a service is failing uh, multiple times and, and it is ad hoc, you don't know which condition is basically responsible for uh, that error, you could uh, you could fine tune the uh, deployment by by bringing in retries. So uh, if, if there is a 500 error, you can, you can you could actually implement a retry to make sure that uh, the next call is is uh, 200 so that you know the the calling component doesn't actually see that error similarly you could increase the timeout to make sure that the dependency call chain is executed before uh, the connection is terminated if there is an external api that is responsible for increasing latencies you could um, bring in timeout to increase the window between the request and response uh, similarly, circuit breaking is making sure that you don't end up calling a bad service uh, by repeatedly calling it. Instead, the service mesh proxy will intercept that and will stop even before you make a call to the rogue service. Uh, similarly, there are other features like deadlines to request balancing. Now, all of them are either available in Linkerd or they're going to come up in the uh, near future with some of the upcoming versions. Um, when it comes to security, Linkerd implements transparent TLS um, certificate validation and policies. You don't need to touch your service at all. If you are calling service B from service A, the moment you implement Link Linkerd, you automatically have an encrypted communication between service A and service B without you creating the um, certificate X.509 infrastructure or tinkering with uh, PKI. Uh, so the goal of Linkerd is to move visibility, reliability, and security to the infrastructure layer and uh, keep the application layer clean so that the developers can focus on the business logic and the functionality rather than worrying about the infrastructure. So <clears throat> all of this becomes very clear when I walk you through the demo. So Linkerd has gone through an evolution. Uh, what you're currently seeing here is a Linkerd 2.x architecture, more precisely 2.3. Uh, the very first version of Linkerd was based on JVM. Uh, and it, it, it came from the legacy of Twitter and other organizations that actually started implementing service mesh back in the in the days of 2015-2016. So the first version of Linkerd 1.0 didn't actually have a control plane. It was written in JVM. It was still a service mesh. It was pretty powerful, but it was not highly optimized for low footprint, lightweight microservices topology. But it was extremely powerful. So in um, in September 2018. Uh, Linkerd 2.0 was announced and that moved away from the JVM to more of modern architecture uh, written using Rust and uh, Go. So the proxy in itself is written using a very powerful language called Rust and the control plane is implemented using Golang. <clears throat> and this combination make, made uh, Linkerd very lightweight, very uh, reliable and extremely fast uh, because it moved away from just having one proxy do all this stuff uh, to uh, separation of concern between the control plane and the data plane. And the data plane is basically the collection of proxies that run um, adjacent to every microservice. And um, the control plane is going to be running inside Kubernetes. And that is what is written in Golang. So the control plane comes with an API that is consumed by a beautiful minimalistic web interface, which will give you a lot of insights and visibility into the microservice deployment. Uh, the public API talks to a real-time metrics engine called TAP, um, and uh, it, it also interfaces with Prometheus. Prometheus is going to be the uh, aggregated uh, metrics engine, and that is interfaced by Grafana to give us very powerful dashboards. So, Every Linkerd proxy component or proxy that runs next to the service 
talks to the uh, proxy API exposed by the controller. So this is very similar to Istio, but the fundamental difference between Istio and Linkerd is the way they are implemented. Istio is very resource intensive when compared to Linkerd. It is, uh, it is complex because there are many moving parts. And the fundamental difference between Istio and Linkerd is the usage of Envoy. So Istio is, um, is an assembly of disparate technologies that came together to form a service mesh. Uh, for example, Envoy existed even before Istio came into the picture. And Istio extended the capability of Envoy to implement uh, uh, the service mesh. So to make sure that the policies that is submitted to Istio translates to Envoy, um, there is a component called Pilot written in, um, you know, in Istio that is responsible for converting the policy definition submitted to Istio to the Envoy proxy. And um, uh, layers like this, which have to work with multiple disparate set of technologies, make Istio slightly heavier. Um, so the installation is slightly complex, it takes longer, maintainability is um, again complex when compared to Linkerd. Now coming to Linkerd, uh, there is no generic proxy that is written and then got extended. You know, for example, Envoy um, and Istio, they are completely independent technologies, but they got together um, to make sure that you have one service mesh. But in Linkerd, the Linkerd proxy is um, a lightweight, purpose-built, highly optimized proxy written exclusively for Linkerd. It is not a general purpose proxy. You cannot deploy Linkerd proxy outside of the context of Linkerd. So that means there's a tight integration between the Linkerd proxy and the control plane. That is one. Second thing is, this is written for simplicity, minimalistic approach, um, reliability, speed, and scalability. So in, in just a few minutes, you can get Linkerd up and running, and it is extremely fast to inject sidecars that is a Linkerd proxy into every pod that's running, um, and you can scale pretty fast. So I'm going to show you all of that in my demo. But the fundamental difference between Istio and Linkerd is simplicity, speed, performance, and reliability. Um, I'm sure Istio will get there. I'm a huge fan of Istio. Um, I've actually worked with multiple customers on uh, integrating Istio with uh, their microservices, but I'm fascinated by the way Linkerd is shaping up, and this is very, very promising. So currently in 2.3, um, there are multiple features that are very, very interesting, like telemetry, retries, timeout, um, auto inject, MTLS, telemetry, um, that is uh, the, the metrics coming through Prometheus to Grafana and so on. Uh, in, in the near term, I think uh, by 2.4 and 2.5, we'll see more of traffic shift shifting, which is for implementing blue-green deployments and canary releases, uh, policy definitions, um, and, and extending the whole traffic policies to the next level, taking to the next level. And then in the midterm, uh, we're going to see capabilities like circuit breaking, distributed tracing, and more. So currently, Linkerd is more focused on observability and maintainability. So the other features like policy-based routing, traffic, all of that is the pipeline. It is going to be out very soon in the near future. So I'm pretty excited to walk you through a demo. And this demo will give you all the steps required to deploy Linkerd and also integrate that with the microservices application. So I'm going to take uh, an existing sample of Linkerd, which is very well written and very easy to understand. And we'll use that as the base project to integrate uh, service meshes Linkerd with that. So we're going to look at three microservices. Uh, called web app, which is the front end, the actual microservice responsible for showing the user interface. Then there is a books uh, microservice responsible for maintaining the list of books. And then there is another microservice called authors, which is again responsible for maintaining a list of authors. And there is a traffic service that is emulating um, a lot of traffic generated to the web app. So we are going to deploy this app and then we'll mesh it. And then we'll monitor the success rate and latency by looking at the dashboard. So this is how the app is going to look like. And I'm, I'm going to share the link uh, to this project and the step-by-step -step guide published on Linkerd documentation. So if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, look at the description. You'll actually find links to the uh, backgrounder that I have written, uh, which is going to come up at the new stack. 
uh, the link to the books app sample on Linkerd Talks and also a pointer to the GitHub repo. So let's get started. We are going to now mesh microservices with Linkerd. All right. So here we are. Now let me uh, make sure we get familiar with the interface. And by the way, the current version of Linkerd runs only in Kubernetes. Now other platforms are um, work in progress, but as of now, Linkerd works very well with Kubernetes. So uh, currently I have Minikube up and running. And unlike my last demo, I'm actually running it on a powerful machine, so this will not crash. So that, the last demo that I tried uh, running Istio was not so powerful. I didn't have enough cores and the VM just died. But this time I have tried multiple times. Um, first thing, Linkerd is much smaller um, and, and requires fewer resources than Istio, number one. Number two, I also have a powerful machine. So that's mini cube for us. And then uh, kubectl is configured to point to mini cube. There we go. I, I launched this about an hour ago, one and a half hour ago. So um, now with this in place, we can actually deploy Linkerd. So the first thing is you know, make sure your Kubernetes version um, matches you know, what is expected by Linkerd. So Linkerd needs at least version 1.9 or above to work. That's because of certain inherent um, capabilities that Linkerd brings for Kubernetes. So things like CRD and so on. So uh, which require Kubernetes version 1.9 plus. So uh, make sure you have um, the, the expected version of Kubernetes in place. And then there is one installer that you need to run. So basically run this curl command and pipe it to shell, which is going to uh, pull the tar file, the tar ball of Linkerd and then expands it and runs it for your architecture. If you're running it on Mac, it's going to be a Darwin based one. Uh, if you're running it on Linux, it basically pulls the Debian version depending on your distribution. So once you have that, you can uh, basically check the version of Linkerd. So currently I'm running stable 2.3, which is the most recent version. Um, so once you have um, all of this, particularly when you're running Linkerd version without Linkerd getting installed, uh, it, it'll, it'll show an error that it is not running on the server side. So you need to now install uh, Linkerd on uh, Kubernetes. So if you actually run this, it basically throws uh, a YAML file. Now, the, the whole Linkerd deployment is a bunch of YAML files. Now what we do is we actually take that YAML file and pipe it into kubectl apply. So what I like about Linkerd is every command is transparent. It is a text file to be more precise, a YAML file, and you can uh, either pipe it directly to kubectl or you can just run it and uh, redirect that to a YAML file, modify it, or take a look at uh, how it is uh, structured. Pretty transparent, you know. It is it is um, just grabbing the YAML file and then feeding that to kubectl. So once you run this, it's going to take a while, and after some time, uh, when you run uh, Linkerd check, this command will make sure that uh, Linkerd is up and running. So all the tick marks confirm that uh, it's installed. So the control plane is up to date, control plane and CLI versions patch. It does uh, a lot of pre-flight check before installing and after installing. So uh, in case you are still installing Linkerd, this is going to wait till all the ports are reporting uh, their health, uh, all the ports are green and um, the, the whole setup is uh, done in the right way. So wait for all the tick marks and after that you can basically look at this namespace uh, so the moment you run this you basically end up creating a new namespace called linkerd and uh, when you look at everything that is created under this namespace called uh, linkerd you will notice that obviously there are a bunch of deployments uh, which results in um, which result in a, a set of pods and then there are a lot of services. Each service endpoint represents, uh, you know, either Grafana or the controller API, um, the the uh, dashboard which is Linkerd web, and so on. And these are the deployments. This is the replica set, and these are the pods. So very very um, simple set of artifacts. There are no fancy uh, elements or no black boxes that get deployed. It is just a bunch of Kubernetes objects uh, which are well designed. So once you have 
the Linkerd deployment done, you can go ahead and launch the dashboard. So this is going to bring up a very clean, minimalistic, simple dashboard. And this dashboard uh, doesn't make you feel that you are sitting inside a Boeing 707 cockpit. This is very simple to navigate and you cannot miss the, the critical capabilities and insights that you need to monitor for your deployment. So the overview shows all the namespaces. Currently, uh, we, we don't have any deployments, no microservices running in the environment. So you'll actually notice there is Linkerd and then there is Cube system and default is obviously empty. So this actually uh, gives us a pretty good insight into our current uh, topology and current deployment. You can also access Grafana from the same URL. So when you actually uh, type slash Grafana, you are taken straight to the Grafana dashboard and these metrics are coming from Prometheus. So these are the only two front ends that we need to deal with. All right, so now that we have the Linkerd infrastructure in place, it's time for us to deploy a set of microservices and then mesh them together and then start monitoring. So let's do that. So the first thing that I'm going to do is to deploy the sample app. So again, uh, first we are going to create a namespace called book app and then we are going to grab the YAML file from Linkerd's uh, uh, website and feed that to kubectl. So now all the commands run one after the other. So now let me run this. So this is now creating the namespace. So now we actually have a new namespace called books app. And within that, uh, we have a bunch of deployments, services, and so on. So you actually notice that There are a few pods. For example, the authors pod uh, is a microservice that is running the authors um, component of the application. Then there is books. Then, then there are three instances of web app and uh, uh, there is traffic that is talking to the web app. So going back to our topology, the traffic emulator talks to the web app, web app talks to books and authors and books talk to each other. So that's the topology. Now, at this point, we still haven't meshed the microservices. So now let's come back to the dashboard and immediately we notice that there is a new namespace called books app. And when we expand that, uh, it actually shows all the deployments. So currently there are four deployments that we have just seen from the CLI. And each deployment translates to a bunch of pods. So currently you know, there are three pods. Um, associated with the web app deployment and then one each for traffic books and authors. So this is the plain vanilla deployment without Linkerd and that's the reason why we can't really see um, any, any telemetry in the, in the portal. You know, this dashboard is literally empty. Now to start making sense and to really start monitoring this microservices deployment, we need to integrate this with uh, Linkerd. So how do we do that? Well, we need to literally inject the Linkerd proxy as a sidecar into every running pod. So you have two ways of doing it. One, you can actually create a namespace and enable Linkerd auto injection, which means any pod that gets deployed under that namespace will automatically get the sidecar. Since we haven't done that, we have to inject the uh, Linkerd proxy as a sidecar into every running deployment and every running pod. Fortunately, it is not that difficult. We will now go ahead and do that with just one command. So uh, if you are familiar with kubectl, kubectl comes with a pretty powerful command called uh, get deploy and the output as YAML. So what we'll actually do is for the entire deployment under this namespace uh, called book, book, books app, uh, we emit the YAML file feed it off to kubectl inject which will carefully insert the sidecar into every pod and then feed that output back to kubectl and that way we are actually refreshing the deployment without manually touching anything so it's a pretty elegant way and i like the way linkerd takes advantage of piping um, and the capabilities of kubectl so let's go ahead and run this 
So now I'm going to run this and immediately it says others injected, traffic injected, and all the deployments are reconfigured. Now when we come back, there is immediately an action. And you notice that the namespace, okay, when we go back to the overview and collapse this section, you will notice that it is meshed. And this is an indication that the entire namespace is currently meshed and it is linkerd enabled. And everything now starts showing one of one, which means a, the, the proxy, the sidecar is now injected. And just a few seconds, we'll, we'll start seeing some metrics. The success rate, the RPS, the percentile latency, you know, P50, P95, P99, and the link to Grafana. So, you know, everything looks good. By the way, let's actually access the app. You know? So now what I'm going to do is to set up the port forwarding for this and then open the actual books app URL. So here we go. So let's say, you know, this is a simple web app. We have authors and books and there is one too many. One author can write multiple books. So first I'm going to add myself as an author. Okay. And then, then I'm going to add a couple of books. For example, Mastering Linkerd. I'm planning to write this one day. So I'm going to add my third 50-page book. I'm going to click on Add Book. Okay, this is great. Now, when I actually edit this, now let's say 300 pages, and when I try to repeatedly update, I I see an error, right? So occasionally, it's an intermittent error. Not every time um, you, you get to see this error, but sometimes you actually see this when you are calling the books API. Now, let's see how Linkerd shows this in our dashboard. Now, if you actually notice, the success rate of the entire deployment is not 100% and it is not green. So obviously, you don't see traffic being meshed. There is no sidecar running in traffic because it doesn't need. It is just a traffic emulator. But all the other three services like authors, books, and web app, they are not enjoying 100% success rate. So to actually understand this better, let's click on web app. Now, when we look at web app, this is beautiful. This actually tells us the entire topology of the microservices deployment. There is traffic and traffic is calling web app and web app is calling books and others. Others, there is no problem. You can add, remove, you know, perform CRUD operations on other yeah, success rate is 100%. But on books, as we have seen, occasionally there is an internal server error, which means it is throwing 500, HTTP 500 error. And the success rate is about 70%. And this cascades all the way to traffic. Uh, so roughly, the success rate of this application is about 72%, 73%. It is hovering somewhere in between. So now it's pretty clear and we are able to visualize who the culprit is. Just because the books app is, books microservices is failing, the entire app is actually struggling with it. Now, what we can actually do is to look at this. Now, if you notice the Okay, let me come back to this and this is another beautiful view. So you also get to see the topology in an interactive graphical form. So, so this is traffic service calling web app and web app talks to books and authors and both authors and books are talking to each other. So now when you actually uh, click on any of the pods, you can look at the live traffic and this keeps refreshing. So for one of the calls, you can actually click on deploy web app and go straight into this. And here you can actually click on this, uh, um, you know, introspect button. And when you select this, you can see all the requests that are from traffic to web app and from web app to books or um, others, depending on how the traffic is flowing. And if you actually expand this, you get to see the request and response for that specific call. 
Now this is 200, it, it is all green, but you know, occasionally we are getting errors. So this is, uh, so you can actually, now, now there is a 500 error. So you can actually see um, it is moving too fast even before I click. So this is HTTP 500 error and it is pretty clear that you know, the books app is failing. So uh, that's not all. You can come back to Grafana and uh, this is Grafana. So when you go to Linkerd top line um, and from there you choose Linkerd deployment and within deployment you can choose the namespace of your choice. So only the mesh namespaces will show up. So obviously books app is uh, meshed so it, it actually comes up and you can select the top level service which is web app and then we notice that with time the success rate is decreasing because there are more number of 500 errors than the um, uh, success rate. And we also notice that there are about uh, six requests per second. Inbound deployment is one and outbound deployment is two. That is traffic calling web app and web app calling books and authors. You can also take a look at the fluctuating success rate. You know, occasionally it is 90%, but sometimes it falls to 70 and that is pretty obvious. So you can now uh, go to books and you notice that you know, there are two inbound deployments. That means two microservices are calling books. One is web app, the other one is authors. Um, there is only one outbound deployment and maybe this is calling authors occasionally. So uh, this is pretty powerful. Now, I, I really like uh, the way it is, it is designed. You know, the dashboards are right there. Prometheus is sitting in between Linkerd and Grafana to make sure that it is collecting and aggregating the metrics and based on the tags you are able to uh, visualize the dashboards and dig into all the insights you need to. So this is um, the basic uh, functionality of Linkerd. You can actually go beyond this but I'm going to save that for another session where I'm going to show you how to implement timeouts, uh, how to implement uh, uh, the, the uh, increase, you know, how to deal with increasing latencies and how to implement retry policies and timeouts. And by then, uh, Linkerd will also support blue, green and canary uh, deployments. So we are going to look at all the uh, best practices of implementing microservices in a distributed environment. So at this point, you know, it is, it is pretty clear that it just takes a few minutes to get started with Linkerd and it is extremely uh, powerful. So now um, that is that is an overview, uh, a complete walkthrough of Linkerd. So coming back to the slide deck, this is what we have done. We deployed three microservices. All of them are written in Ruby. Again, uh, you, you have access to source code and this is a phenomenal um, simple yet powerful sample from Linkerd folks. So uh, you can you can access it, uh, this, this from the documentation site. So this was the topology that we have seen and we have meshed microservices with Linkerd. So that brings us to the end of this session. I want to thank our sponsors, the new stack. And tomorrow by this time, you'll actually have a Linkerd article go li going live at the new stack. And whenever I upload the video to YouTube, click on the resources section, you will have links to everything that I have covered. Um, so Newstack is the media partner for MI2. Foghorn is uh, a Bay Area based edge computing company. Um, they are also one of the sponsors. Portworks, a container native storage company in Bay Area. Um, they are one of the power partners and I really thank them for their support. And before we go to the questions and answers, I want to announce what's coming up next. Because this was all about infrastructure, I am uh, talking about the uh, intelligence track next time. So I'm pretty excited to bring you everything that you wanted to know about Google Corel Dev Kit and USB Accelerator. So Google Corel Development Board is a system on chip. It's like a Raspberry Pi device, but comes with an edge GPU to accelerate machine learning. Um, so it's a pretty fascinating kit. I, I got it last month uh, when I went to US. Unfortunately, it's not available in India yet. Um, due to some regulatory issues, but I could uh, buy it in US and I have been tinkering with it for the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to show you how to set up your Google Corel dev kit and how to use that for image classification, object detection and face detection at the edge. So we're going to run a few TensorFlow models 
uh, use some static images and also connect a camera and see how to perform inferencing on uh, real-time video streams. So attend this webinar if you want to know everything about Google Corel platform and HTTPS. I'm pretty excited to bring this to you. Um, so sign up at mi2.live. This is on June 13th, Thursday at 9 a.m. PT, 9.30 p.m. IST. So that brings us to the end of this session. I want to bring up a couple of polls while I'm going to take the questions. So how relevant was the webinar content? Did, did I deliver what I promised? Did it meet your expectations? Cool. Okay, I only see a few people participating in the poll. I appreciate if, if everyone can uh, take part and, and tell me how relevant was the webinar. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, almost 80% of you felt it is very relevant and others thought it is somewhat relevant. That's absolutely fine. It's a good indicator. Now, how do you rate the overall quality of of the webinar. Now this includes the content, the demos, my presentation, everything. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for rating it as one of the um, better sessions that I have delivered. 80% of you felt it is excellent. Thank you. All right. So time for Q&A. Uh, let me see what questions we have. Are service mesh technology is going to replace Spring Cloud? Not sure. No, they are. They may overlap to some extent, but service mesh is completely independent. They, they are not specific to a language. They are not written for a specific framework language or runtime. They are totally independent. And as you have seen, you can integrate with uh, microservices written in any language. It is totally agnostic. Cloud, uh, Spring Cloud is typically used with Java. Maybe it supports some of these capabilities, but it is exclusively meant for um, Java based uh, services. Is the session recorded? Absolutely. You can um, you can visit my YouTube channel. And in fact, since you have attended, you're going to receive an email with links to the recordings, the slide deck, um, the article and the source code. So you can actually repeat all of this in your own uh, environment on your development workstation. I'm going to share that with all the attendees. Can we do JWT authentication? Not, I'm not very sure. I need to check. I'll take that as an offline question and I'll, I'll come back to you. As far as I know, this may not be supported uh, because in most of the scenarios, JWT is used for interactive um, authentication. Um, but MTLS is the most preferred, but I, I need to confirm. So I will take that as a follow-up and I'll come back to you. Can we install Linkerd without Kubernetes admin level privileges? Um, yes, so it, it is not about admin privileges, but you need to have a service account and role-based access control enabled. For example, if you are deploying this on uh, Google Kubernetes engine, you need to make sure that your identity is added to the service admin or back. So that is that is the expected uh, uh, privilege, but you don't need to be completely an administrator level uh, user for that. Yes, the sample app was deliberately broken to randomly throw HTTP 500 errors. The question is, was the sample app broken to demonstrate the service mesh capabilities? Yes, it was a deliberate attempt to throw 500 errors. So what are the scenarios where you use Linkerd versus Istio and uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of three service mesh technologies, Istio, Linkerd and Council? Well, it is not something that I can answer uh, in, this, in this session. Uh, if you have noticed, I've been covering Istio. Now I covered uh, Linkerd and in the next topic of the infrastructure track, I'm going to bring you Council Connect. And once we are done with that, I'm going to do a deep dive and we'll do comparison of all the frameworks. And I'll also take specific areas, for example, observability and telemetry, how each of these perform, um, tracing, routing, and, and uh, 
the the traffic policies you know how do they perform so stay tuned uh, this is going to be a topic by itself as we go along in the next quarter or so i'm going to bring in more and more comparative sessions um, doing a side by side compare and contrast of these uh, emerging service mesh technologies how much resource linkerd requires well um, the, 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 it is not officially documented i cannot tell you how many cores how many uh, what is the ram that you need but uh, currently i am running it on a mini cube with four cores and 8 gb and it is being performing pretty well so you don't need a lot of resources to run uh, linkerd how many companies have you seen um, adopting service mesh in production workloads this is a nascent technology um, there are some case studies for example linkerd 1.0 is used by a lot of enterprises istio is being used by many companies um, so microservices kubernetes containers service mesh all of them are pretty new emerging nascent technologies so uh, in, in the, the coming months we'll actually see more and more enterprises and more and more production workloads embracing these technologies but for now this is more like an evolving technology and it is solving specific problems and i'm very sure uh, many customers are going to adopt this how do we compare service mesh with api gateways such as com well um, api gateways do something very different than a service mesh there is a very tiny overlap between service mesh and an api gateway that is mostly to do with the ingress integration um, and routing um, and maybe logging and tracing of inbound and outbound calls but that's where the api gateway stops whereas a service mesh goes way beyond it is first of all um, very very uh, non intrusive in terms of its integration with every service it, it sits at a very low level than the api gateway and api gateway will in fact um, benefit when it is interfaced with a service mesh so api mesh api gateway is uh, typically meant for managing apis at scale whereas service mesh is meant for observability security um, and routing policies there is a tiny bit of overlap uh, in the routing and traffic policies but that's where it all starts and ends for eks gke and aks what is the mesh that is used well you are free to use any mesh of your choice if you are using gke there is one checkbox that says install istio and that will install istio along with kubernetes but beyond that you are free to use for example you can run linkerd on uh, gke or you can you could run istio on aks it doesn't really matter because ultimately it gets deployed on a kubernetes cluster uh, which is independent of the underlying managed service provider how can we use kubernetes without using any of the service mesh absolutely service mesh came much later than kubernetes uh, you don't need to use kubernetes uh, service mesh to use kubernetes they are two independent technologies but they work really well if they are integrated so that brings us to the end of this uh, webinar and as i as i promised i am going to bring you more and more content um, and as we go along i am going to do a deep dive on istio linkerd and console and even side by side comparison of these emerging technologies stay tuned uh, thanks again for attending and do sign up for my upcoming sessions at mi2.live uh, this is janakiram signing off hoping to see you in the next webinar thank you